the Germans came into Paris and uh, and then there was a quick succession of things that started to happen. We were asked to register and uh, and then we had to turn in our radios. Asked to uh, register? Register as Jews. Where? At the police station. <clears throat> and that was really the, the first inkling that I had that there was something special or difficult or, or bad about being a Jew. And I remember in the metro you couldn't go in some, ca in some cars, on some, uh, what do you call it, wagon, and in the, you had to go home by 8 o'clock. And I also remember one day a Sunday afternoon, my mother had dressed us three little girls beautifully, and we each of us had the star, but my mother forgot to put a star on her costume. So she really panicked and she said, I have to leave you. You walk on that side, and mommy's going to walk on the other side of the street, and we'll go home. Watch, watch me from the other side of the street to go home. And we walked sep without our mother for the first time, and, but we watched her on the other side of the street and we went home. And because if she would have been caught without the stars, she would have been put in a camp straight away. The commanding officer of the Germans came and asked the principal of the lycée to give him the names of all the Jewish students at the lycée Pasteur. All the names, the names sounding Jewish, you wanted to have all the names and the addresses of the Jewish students at the Lycée Pasteur. So the sans, the proviseur, the uh, principal of the Lycée, uh, was really a wonderful person. And so the first thing they did was that they made copies. And they worked all night of the names and put all the original and addresses and put all the original documents in a safe, way outside of Paris. Then, and again, they told the uh, people they take some time to do all this work and give them a few days. And then what they did is they took all the Jewish sounding names, completely changed them, and changed the addresses. To fictitious addresses? To fictitious addresses and then gave that list, it was all finished, to the German authorities. Later on, when the, the new law came over, I got to give away my business. And I've got no right to go to work. May I work anyway? How did you work anyway? The, the people, but even uh, it was not Jewish. I was a good hairdresser. So, I entered the books and I went to work for him. So they didn't stop you? No, from no, I worked all the time. But they took your, your business away? Yes. We had never had very much, but around that, just before the, the, the invasion, things were getting a little better for us financially. And my mother had gone out and bought a radio. Maybe my father was the one who bought it, I don't know. But there was a radio in the house. And I can tell you that radio was really important to me. Uh, it had a green eye, you know, it was a very modern kind of a blonde cabinet with brown cloth over the speaker. And, um, and I was fascinated by that thing. I used to imagine that there was a miniature orchestra inside that box that made all that music. I, mean, I was pretty naive. But that was, you know, a big thing. And then my, mother, my father had also gotten us uh, a wind-up record player and a couple of records. And I remember uh, there was uh, a Viennese waltz and uh, and The Wedding of the Painted Doves, which was my favorite. And I could play that thing all day long. Now we had to turn in that radio, and that really got me very upset. I was crying over it. 
from day one, uh, June 14, 1940, when the German came to Paris, until May 1945, when I become again a free man, I was all the time in hiding under a false name, uh, persecuted as a Jew, and uh, feeling mostly at uh, the French people who until then I more or less venered, like them very much, they become the number one enemy of the Jews. Meaning there is very, very, very strong anti-Jewish feeling all over France.